And tell us about this, uh, this next robber. Well, in this case, we have a very strong lead because the robber has a very distinctive voice that we're hoping the viewers will recognise. <laughs> in connection with the same armed robbery, we're also hoping to interview the winner of Billboard magazine's best new album for the rock dance crossover Dangerous, Michael Jackson, <laughs> arguably the most influential male solo singer of the 1980s. At one point, the robber appears to notice the presence of the security camera. Phil Collins, Peter Gabriel, Sting, Robert Palmer, How I Hate, middle-aged, boring, sensible pop stars, I can't wait till Sting discovers in all his profound concern about the disappearing rainforest, he's just sublimating the fact that he's going bald. <laughs> and when you look at Robert Palmer, Robert Palmer, when you look at Robert Palmer, don't you just think that somewhere there's a non-league football club missing a manager? <laughs> The Simple Truth, Live Aid, Red Hot and Blue, always a nexus for these mortgage sensible rock stars like Midge Yore. Nuh, nuh, nuh. <laughs> because a proper pop star couldn't do the live location report from Ethiopia because he wouldn't be able to understand the concept. He couldn't get his head round what was going on. And now we go over live to Eritrea, which has seen some of the worst of the suffering, for an on-the-spot location report from Billy Idol. Hi, all right, yeah, see a lot of you chicks here are so excited you've got your tits out already. Rago! Boring pop stars. I sit in my all-seater stadium, holding my mortgage rock programme, show sec men patrol my well-drilled all-seater response, and I thank my benevolent stars if only I get the fake encore. The fake encore, that really gets on my tits. You go and see EMF, and what I love about EMF is like, I'm not hard, but I could beat up every single member of that band, no problem. <laughs> you go and see EMF, they do a four-hour set, leave the stage, they haven't done unbelievable, will there be an encore? <laughs> you to get people going, more, more. I've tried to get on to more, but I think we've done all our songs, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. Wait a moment. Wait a moment. What was the name of that number one hit single we had? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, only, um, only um, 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 unbelievable. 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 How did it go again? How did it go? Um, 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 you're unbelievable. No, that's rubbish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wonder if pop stars are like that all the time. You know, if you have Sting round for dinner. Uh, right. And uh, who else wants pudding? No, 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 I've got to go. You've been great. You've been great, but there's no more time. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> OK, I'm back. Yeah, I'm back. Let's have pudding. <laughs> anyway, the more thing was, I was, I was locked out and it was that way. Oh, excuse me. Now, uh, coffee. No, no, I've got to go. You've been great. God bless you all. God bless you. But this is it. There's no more time. Good night. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's got to go on all night. Let's have coffee! He was created to be a perfect man. But one part of him was never quite finished. Coming soon to a video shop near you, Edward Colander Hands. <laughs> the story of an outsider and the town that grew to love him. God, this lettuce needs draining. <laughs> what on earth am I going to do? Gee, I wish I could afford a shower, but I've only got this bucket. La, 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 la. Gee, Edward, your colander hand makes a great improv. Too shabby. <laughs> I don't go into libraries because I've discovered that it is impossible for me to be sat in a library for more than 45 seconds without developing a non-negotiable hard-on. 
I think it's not just me. I reckon that when he goes into a library, even Bernard Levin must feel his prim, withered on the vine, austerity years genitals stirring across and up the left-hand side of his grey worsted pants. <laughs> Alternatively, Barry White must explode. <laughs> I thought so. The libido is like a character in the Beano. Whenever it's most supposed to stay clean, tidy and quiet, you know, that's when it's going to get dirty. It's the silence and those quiet please signs. They just make it worse. It's amazing where the libido can decide to set up home. There is a man in America, this is true, who can only get sexually excited by putting a bin liner on his head and then allowing a budgie to fly about inside the bin liner. <laughs> well, how did he know that? <laughs> well, he was sitting at home one day thinking, oh, God, there's a bin liner on my head and now there's a freaking budgie flying about inside it. And suddenly he thought, hold on. <laughs> I've got a raging horn. Recently, a margarine spread was launched under the name I Can't Believe It's Not Butter. <laughs> the butter industry wouldn't allow it to be shown on television, and the subsequent publicity made it enormously successful. So successful, in fact, that other companies are using the same idea with the launch of products like Surely These Are Pineapple Chunks? <laughs> oh, but these must be gravy granules, aren't they? And bollocks, this is custard powder, and I'll deck anyone who says it isn't. Often, if you're seated at a meal or in the pub, you don't actually clock how drunk you are until you stand up. And then, suddenly, getting from where you've been safely sitting to the lavatory becomes a major operation. Every move has to be thought about. A woman comes in and the parent says, oh, and then she took off her clothes and says, oh, what happened then, what happened then, what happened then? Fell off your perch. Thank you, woman. What a funny joke. Excuse me, I am just going for a slodge. Is disgusting, especially spirits, you know. When you drink whiskey or gin or vodka, are you supposed to do this? <sighs> <laughs> that's part of the pleasure experience, is it? <sighs> <laughs> that goes with spirits, that's like a cocktail. Barman, I'll have a gin and <sighs> <laughs> But there's this pressure on men to drink, isn't there? You know, because drink is the elixir of masculinity. It's like the more you drink, the more of a man you are. Even women. Like, uh, one woman who grew up drinking an awful lot was Jeff Capes. 
one of the great myths about drinking is that you should line your stomach with a pint of milk before a heavy session because then you still feel well in the morning. Yeah, about as well as anyone who's swallowed seven and a half pints of dry roast peanut lager and brandy flavour yoghurt. <laughs> Something you quite often hear people say is, honestly, I actually drive better when I'm drunk. Now, if you get stopped by the police, they've got these new electronic breathalysers that can not only tell you how much you've drunk, but exactly what it is you've been drinking. Oh, Mark Allman, didn't it? <laughs> Controversy always surrounds any role model figure who is seen drinking. In the case of Inspector Morse, you do start to wonder how he ever manages to solve anything. Pathologist is on his way, sir. Thanks. Where's the inspector? Just arrived, sir. Oh. <laughs> Hello, sir. I'm uh, afraid they made a bit of a mess of him. He's been uh, clubbed round the head and uh, stabbed eight times. He's dead! <laughs> Shit, bloody hell! It's a dead man! Come on, please! He's dead! Dead! That's right, sir. Who killed him? Uh, well, that's for you to find out, sir. Nick. Well, I killed him. No, I was leaving the ark. I'm from over there. <laughs> oh, then we've got the rest, mate. I love you, Lewis. <laughs> God, I'm angry. Look, you're going to snap out of this, sir. There's been a murder, Lewis. <laughs> Fancy a pint? Things people say to the television. Number one, BBC weather forecaster Suzanne Charlton. Tomorrow's eat some food. Eat. You've got to eat. 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 Edward, those things you used to pick up fluff and static off records with hands. God, but this record needs cleaning. What on earth am I going to do? Rachel finished with me, my one ambition, tunnel vision, shrunken world view, was that the next time she sees me, I'll be with this new and brilliant girlfriend that would ace her out completely and make her realise just how wrong she was. I was so crap, my only fantasies were that I'll be coming out of some club with this new and brilliant girlfriend going, hey, not so fast, you hot Swedish fox. <laughs> Don't forget, you've got to be up early to present that breakfast time TV weather forecast that you do. <laughs> oh, uh, hello, Rachel. <laughs> Because you've got to do something, you know, whatever. Some people go and see an analyst because they say it's just like talking to a friend, but <laughs> it'd have to be a lot better than talking to some of my friends. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, the one question that needs to be asked when any relationship ends is not how do I cope with the loss or what is there in my emotional history which seems to lead to a recurring pattern of unsuccessful relationships, but uh, did she chuck you or did you chuck her? <laughs> Well, it was sort of mutual, really. I mean, no, just... right. So she chucked you then? <laughs> no, no. I mean, if anything, I chucked her. Actually, right. I think there might be some kind of denial going on here, a kind of refusal to admit rejection. <sighs> yes, I, I suppose so. Yes. Ah, she did chuck you. Your shit. Ah! <laughs> now, now, there's a, a, a few things I think you could do here to help you in time to value yourself again. Uh, one of these might be, for example, to phone up her new boyfriend at three o'clock in the morning and say, Time to die! <laughs> How do you feel about that? Because all your friends have to do a little quasi-analysis, you know? They all feel they have to come up with a sentence that at some point includes the words insecure. You know, when all you really want is them just to be on your side for it, you know? Just to come round and go, here, 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 <laughs> and then leave. They all had to get on my case and say that I had a bad attitude towards Rachel, but I did not. And to prove that I didn't, I've written a recreation of the scene where we split up exactly as it happened, with an actress playing the part of Rachel just to show that I did not have a bad attitude towards her. 
The part of Rob Newman will be played by David Baddiel. <laughs> That's all right, Morrissey. Please, don't mention it. No, every day is like Sunday, comma. Every day is silent and grey. Yeah. Well, good luck with it. Bye. <laughs> ah, that'll be Rachel. <laughs> Rob, for some inexplicable reason, I've decided to abandon the happiness I have enjoyed with you and go out with Martin, of all people. Martin? But he looks like David Baddiel. <laughs> yes, I'm mental. I do not resent you for it. Even though it was only last Wednesday that I turned down what looked like a definite shag with two identical twins. Eskimo women they were, and one of them once had a trial for Barnet. Because of you. Oh no, I've walked into the door. I've just recorded the events as they happened. But when you go out with someone, it's you that chucks them. Whenever your ex phones up, it just feels like it's the most irritating interruption, you know? It seems like they only phone during the best bit of the best film they've ever shown on TV. You know, you're watching Tommy Steele. And she could be saying something, you know, really witty and warm and wise, and I'm like, what, what? No, I'm not being distant, I'm just busy. I'm just in the middle of something. Half a sixpence. <laughs> But when your relationship really goes into its death throes, like, you know, when your partner's shoe seems so irritating it's hindering your breathing, you know, like, <laughs> like Steve is with Tanya just at the moment, actually. Uh, those last days are always made... <laughs> ..that much more unbearable by the fact that suddenly there seems to be no hiding place. And I wonder why we hold on with tears in our eyes. Really, lovey? It seems to me that you've run out of things to say to each other. And what... Tonight on Newsnight, we ask, when did Steve and Tanya last have sex? <laughs> I am Steve Punt's dustman. And yes, sir, I can report that up until three months ago, empty contraceptive sheath cartons were making a regular appearance amongst his ordinary household refuse. <laughs> With me, I have Barry White. Ah, uh, what's needed here between this man and this woman is more love, more. It's bad talking to mutual friends about the split, because you start worrying so much about how the other person has taken it. Um, I saw your ex the other day. How is she? Well, not too good, really. I mean, you know, she's not eating, she's hardly going out. It's, you know, it's, it's bad. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> One pressure that builds up in long-term relationships for me is that I start to become tortured by what my imagination of what my single friends, specifically Rob, are getting up to, you know. Every time I'm having an argument in the middle of Gateway, at the back of my mind is this terrible image. Rebound. Oh, wrong house. Uh, uh. He was created to be a perfect man, but one part of him was never finished. Coming soon to a video shop near you. Edward Good Movie Guide Knob. Hey, guys, I really want to go see a movie. Yeah, but which one? Hey! Apparently, Jean de Florette is a fascinating study of dynastic tensions. <laughs> Say, Edward, your good movie guide knob sure makes a good movie guide. <laughs> Number three, Last of the Summer Wine. Oh, no, they're all going to die any minute. Mind those steps. 
Oh, easy, no. Look, easy, he's lost easy, his easy, bus easy. pass. He's lost his bus pass. Is it Did someone had to take you to the toilet? Number Is it four, time for that? Luciano Pavarotti. Don't get off your fat git. <laughs> Give your dinner to Suzanne Charlton. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, the press still seem to believe that sex scandals ruin politicians. But Bill Clinton in the US and Paddy Ash down here both found that as a result of the publicity, their opinion poll ratings actually went up, not down. John Major is a man who cares, a man who understands, and a man who has slept with Julia Roberts <laughs> several times. Last year, he copped off with Princess Stephanie of Monaco. And when he went to Wimbledon, he did it with Steffi Graf and her doubles partner, whose name he didn't even bother to find out. As Prime Minister, John Major has gained respect worldwide. But between the sheets, he's an animal. Ask Stephanie Powers. Ask Maureen Lipman. Ask the blonde one off of Baywatch. <laughs> the atmosphere here at Westminster is highly charged. Opinion polls give Neil Kinnock a 12.5% lead since the revelation that in 1986 he had done it with Banana Rammer. <laughs> John Major replied that he had lived for four years with Marilyn Monroe once slipped a length to Kim Bassinger <laughs> and pointed out that once a week he has a private audience with the Queen. <laughs> it's your ex-girlfriend. The one where it was you that chucked her. What? What? No, I'm not being distant. I'm just busy. I'm just in the middle of something. Jerry Conlon, one quarter of the Guildford Four, sits in the hole for 15 years for something he never did, released, and then six weeks later is pulled up in possession of an eighth of a gram of cocaine, and they have the audacity to take him to court and give him a two-year suspended sentence. No, 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 no. The way I see it, they owe him 15 years. He can do whatever crimes he wants <laughs> to the value of 15 years. The judge should be saying, Well, Jerry, here's the brochure. It's up to you. You can do uh, three armed robberies, six arsons, a murder, or some mix and match combinations. Two burglaries, ten shopliftings as basket fillers, and a manslaughter. I mean, after what he's been through, I think an eighth of a gram of cocaine is pretty tame, you know? I don't take drugs myself, but if I had just spent 15 years in the hole for something I never did, they would find me on my back in a field with a row of hypodermic needles in each arm, surrounded by freshly slaughtered cattle, their blood steaming in the midwinter air as naked fifth-form schoolgirls frolic <laughs> and gamble over my champagne-smeared body. That is what I would do, even if it was just a parking ticket. <laughs> I couldn't give a toss which side wins in Northern Ireland, who gets the keys. All I know is the most repetitive job in the world is desk sergeant of a Belfast incident room. An RUC officer is shot dead getting out of a cab. Three days later, the IRA phone up. Hello? You know the RUC officer that was killed? Well, we did it. Hey, well, look, thanks ever so much for phoning up, cos we were completely stumped. <laughs> I couldn't work out who it was. I was racking my brains, thinking, Professor Plum. <laughs> oh, it was you! Hey, Chief, you know that RUC officer that was killed? It was only the IRA. No. That's just a little bit too neat. <laughs> Although the IRA do do one entertaining thing when they rain down missiles on John Major's backyard. What the hell's going on here? It looks like the Blue Peter Garden. <laughs> only the second attempt on a Prime Minister's life since the original gunpowder plot. Foiled when Guy Fawkes was spotted at the gates of Parliament by a guard whose suspicions, apparently, were first aroused on seeing a man who was two foot high, made of an old pillow, with a balloon for a head. <laughs> Fawkes was also the only man in the 17th century to wear an Arsenal scarf 
an old pair of his dad's corduroy trousers and travel on a wooden go-kart. <laughs> In fact, of course, we know that the gunpowder plot was in fact carried out by these men. The joint winners of the 1605 Richard Branson look-alike contest. <laughs> Jimmy Hill. Well, 